So what have we done to uh, get around that? And uh, many of us have been working uh, with this drug. It's an old drug, <laughs> repurposed, uh, called cyclophosphamide. It was synthesized in 1958, FDA approved in 1959, just to show you how things were different back then. Um, but anyhow, uh, given in very high doses, this drug is really immunosuppressive. And, and I'll, I won't walk you through uh, all of this, but just to say that this is a prodrug, so it has to be activated in the, the liver. And the fate of the drug depends on the cell in which it gets into. So the bloodstream transport forms of the drug uh, go into the, uh, the average cell, and, and it, it causes DNA strand breaks and, and causes the cell uh, to die. And it's, uh, it actually turns into something called phosphoramide mustard. It's basically like nitrogen mustard uh, that, that, that kills the cells. But the interesting thing is hematopoietic stem cells, and actually stem cells of all classes, cardiac, GI, brain, etc., have very high levels of this enzyme here depicted in the, the pink, known as aldehyde dehydrogenase. And aldehyde dehydrogenase takes these transport forms and instead of turning it into <coughs> phosphoramide mustard, turns it into something called carboxyphosphamide, which is inert. So there is no dose of cyclophosphamide that you can give a human being that will kill stem cells because of this enzyme aldehyde dehydrogenase. Now, the lymphocytes, the ones that cause graft-versus-host disease, have very little of this enzyme in it, and that's why they are so exquisitely sensitive to this drug. So, um, again, what I want you to get from this is hematopoietic stem cells have high levels of aldehyde dehydrogenase. That makes them resistant to high doses of cyclophosphamide. Lymphocytes have very low levels of aldehyde dehydrogenase, and they're exquisitely sensitive. So, what we've been doing is giving high doses of cyclophosphamide after the bone marrow transplant to basically get rid of the lymphocytes that cause the graft-versus-host disease, but to preserve the stem cells that can recapitulate the immune system. And we've shown in uh, now over uh, 400 patients that this mitigates graft-versus-host disease. This allows for the greater use of alternative donors, including haploidentical bone marrow uh, donors. And as I mentioned, almost everyone has a haploidentical donor at any time. Uh, this has been incredibly helpful for malignant diseases in expanding the donor pool, but it doesn't get around the number one problem of bone marrow transplant and hematologic malignancies, which is relapse. Uh, so this could really revolutionize the treatment of genetic and autoimmune diseases. So uh, one of the hypotheses that we wanted to attest and uh, <laughs> I was having a conversation about hypotheses earlier at lunch, so here you go. Uh, Non-myeloablative conditioning with post-transplant hydrocyclophosphamide will expand the number of patients with sickle cell disease who are eligible for bone marrow transplant by allowing for safe and effective use of related half-matched or haploidentical donors. So let me just digress a little bit there and tell you a little bit about sickle cell anemia. I think you know, most of you have, have heard about this. This is a genetic disease. It's actually often referred to as the first genetic disease uh, because in the late 1940s, it was actually Linus Pauling uh, that discovered the mutation in sickle cell disease on chromosome 11. And it's a single uh, amino acid substitution uh, on, at position 6. And it causes uh, the abnormal polymerization of hemoglobin in the red cells. And it causes them to form this sickle cell uh, shape and it can include vessels and cause ischemia, and uh, it is a, a horrible, horrible uh, disease that causes terrible pain, uh, organ dysfunction, and premature death. Um, in spite of this being the first genetic disease, it's almost embarrassing that there is only one FDA-approved drug for this disorder, and hydroxyurea, and it's got limited efficacy. Uh, so let's go uh, through the genetics of sickle cell disease. Um, Again, if uh, uh, you have two carriers uh, that have uh, offspring, there's a 25% uh, chance that you'll uh, inherit uh, both alleles and lead to sickle cell uh, disease. 50% chance uh, that, you, that you sh uh, any offspring will be a carrier, and, and a one in four chance that uh, uh, the offspring won't have uh, either of the abnormal sickle diseases. 
uh, genes. You have to have both to, to have the disease. Carriers are asymptomatic. So uh, the epidemiology, about 1 in 4,000 births in African Americans uh, have sickle cell disease, but it can also affect uh, Hispanics and even whites with the mixing of, of uh, um, different people. And, and uh, there's about 100,000 patients suffering from sickle cell disease in the United States. The median survival is 42 in males, 48 in females, but around the world sickle cell disease causes a half a million people uh, annually. It's also a huge cost to the United States because these patients need a lot of care. And the annual cost of medical care in the United States and people who suffer from sickle cell disease exceeds $1.1 billion. Uh, these are the average costs for children, adults. Uh, a 45-year-old with sickle cell disease will, will uh, cost uh, over a million dollars in their lifetime. But this is a conservative estimate, and as this author states out, when one considers the additional contributions of sickle cell disease associated with reduced quality of life, uncompensated care, lost productivity, and premature mortality, the full burden of sickle cell disease is likely to be quite higher. These patients often can't go to school or miss a lot of school. They often can't go to college. They often can't hold down jobs because they are spending so much time uh, either in the clinic or in the hospital, or they are severely disabled from the condition. Now, bone marrow transplant curing sickle cell disease is not new. This was done in 1984 for the first time, and it was in a patient who had sickle cell disease who developed acute leukemia and had an allergen egg bone marrow transplant. The transplant was primarily done for the leukemia, but because the donor had sickle cell trait and was just a carrier, they no longer made uh, sickle cells when, when they engrafted. So this has been a cure, but since that first case in 1984, less than 400 bone marrow transplants worldwide have been done. The reason for that is because most patients with sickle cell disease aren't going to have an HLA match sibling donor, number one. Uh, they've tried cord blood, really difficult to engraft. The other reason is most sickle cell patients could not tolerate a fully myeloablative conditioning regimen because they have so much end organ damage from the sickle cell disease itself that it would be too toxic. And there's also a huge rate of graft failure in patients with sickle cell disease getting a bone marrow transplant. Part of the reason is they haven't had prior, uh, prior chemotherapy, so they're not as immunosuppressed. But the other reason is, is that they are often treated with multiple transfusions, so they develop lots of alloantibodies, uh, and they can develop antibodies against the uh, donor. This is our uh, mini bone marrow transplant regimen or, uh, that, that we use with post-transplant cyclophosphamide. Again, don't get caught up in the details. This is a non-myeloblative conditioning regimen. This is really well tolerated, done outpatient. Um, and, um, but the, the key feature here is that on day three and day four, after the bone marrow transplant, the patients are treated with high doses of cyclophosphamide, 50 milligrams per kilogram for two consecutive days. Uh, they're also given some other immunosuppressive drugs out uh, for, for, for a period of time, but these are eventually weaned off. And this was really worked out, um, uh, actually, George Santos, uh, who, who started uh, in the field of bone marrow, was one of the early pioneers, did this back in the 1960s. And it was Ephraim Fuchs and Leo Lusnick that redid his experiments uh, in, in the 90s. But they were able to show that the timing of the cyclophosphamide afterwards really makes a difference. Because what happens is the two immune systems meet. And what the, the um, uh, the alloreactive T uh, or lymphocytes that cause graft-versus-host disease seem to be maximally stimulated at day three and day four after the bone marrow transplant. So they see the, the host, they start rapidly uh, uh, proliferating, and cyclophosphamide, like other alkylating uh, agents, kills rapidly de dividing uh, cells even better than cells that are not rapidly dividing. So the timing was very important here. So let's jump forward, and this is actually a, cl a clinical trial that was just uh, published uh, in November of 2012. 
And we screened uh, 19 patients with sickle cell disease. These are patients, obviously, with severe sickle cell disease. There were 17 adults, two pediatric patients. We were able to find a donor for 17 of the 19 patients. I mean, prior to this, maybe, you know, 8%, 9% would, would have a, a suitable donor. Well, here you go, three matched siblings. Uh, so three of the 17 uh, had, had, a, had a matched sibling, and we obviously used that if they had one. Uh, the other 14 had half-matched donors, and uh, eight of these patients engrafted. So when you look at it, this overall, 11 of the 19, or about 58% of the screen patients were cured of their sickle cell disease. 11 of 17 of the patients who actually got the transplant were cured. Now, these are primarily haploidentical donors. I showed you that used to have about a 50% mortality. We've done tw now over 20 consecutive patients with sickle cell disease with no mortality from bone marrow transplantation. Furthermore, we've had no graft versus host disease that's required treatment in spite of using half-matched donors. Uh, let me show you one of our uh, patients, and this is a, a, a very instructive case. It's a 27-year-old female who had sickle cell disease, very severe sickle cell disease. Uh, but she also had, uh, as a teenager, developed severe lupus. And was being treated in our lupus center with multiple immunosuppressive drugs, steroids, uh, Celsept, uh, pulse doses of cyclophosphamide, Imuran, etc. In spite of that, she developed severe kidney disease, lupus nephritis, and uh, had all the markers of lupus with low complement levels, anti-DNA uh, antibodies, and obviously had all the problems of sickle cell disease with low hemoglobins, uh, hemolytic anemia, uh, etc. She had the bone marrow transplant, and uh, by three months, the markers of um, the lupus had started to, to, to go away and uh, have normalized. And also, you can see her hemoglobin comes up to normal, and all her blood parameters go back to normal. I can tell you, this woman is now two and a half years out from bone marrow transplantation. She is off all of her pain medicines, uh, and is not requiring transfusions anymore for her sickle cell disease. And she is also off all of her medications, and has gone into complete remission from her lupus. Let me show you her lupus nephritis. This is the urine protein uh, the, the protein creatinine ratio, which in lupus nephritis, your kidneys have holes in it, basically, and get leaky, and you have uh, a lot of proteinuria. This is really high levels, and patients like this uh, usually uh, will end up on dialysis within five to 10 years. Um, the, the, uh, and she had already had this for several years. Here's when the bone marrow transplant was done. Here she is at a year, and uh, I can tell you uh, she's still out, uh, completely off of her immunosuppressive drugs. Her lupus nephritis is cured. She has no evidence of her lupus, and she has no evidence of her sickle cell disease. So, uh, conclusions. Allogeneic bone marrow transplant is the only cure uh, that exists for sickle cell disease. High-dose cyclophosphamide post bone marrow transplant safely expands the donor pool by allowing for the use of haploidentical donors. The majority of patients with sickle cell disease are potentially eligible for therapy with curative intent. This, uh, you know, <laughs> gets me really excited <laughs> because I've dealt with a lot of sickle cell. And to be able to make this statement now is, is really powerful. Um, and I will tell you that the patient I just showed you who had to drop out of college, has subsequently gone on, finished an MPH and an MBA from the University of Maryland, and is out looking for a job right now.